So what are we talking about today in terms of bridging the digital divide? Couple of things. Um, these numbers definitely have tremendously probably if not triple, but women and minority businesses represent 70% of all US small business owners. Well, it'd be interesting to see what those numbers look like due to the pandemic and how many businesses may have went out of business. But one of the things that we are now getting over is that originally 65% of diverse small businesses felt it was too complicated or didn't know how to do online marketing and advertising. Well, over the last three months, you pretty much had to figure it out and figure it out fast. And what did that look like? Oh, sorry. These are my upcoming sessions. We'll, we'll go back to that. So what did that really look like? So this is part of where the interactive starts. If you want, you can sign into your Google account and you can go ahead and set up a Google Drive or a Google Doc, you know, just to take notes. This is part of the setup. So let me uh, fast forward. So what we're going to learn today, design thinking, is learning the principles of design thinking process. If you did not know, this is actually a real process that was developed to help create innovative solutions, to identify problems within your business. And to be honest with you, you can use it in a personal reflective manner. Um, this process allows you to build out solutions and collaborative, co collaborate with people um, constantly throughout the year, but also maintain you know, where are their gaps or whatnot in your projects? So what is design thinking? Design thinking is a creative problem solving process that focuses on a user centered approach to create a solution that is technology, technologically and economically feasible. I need you all to understand and, and please know focuses on a user centered approach. Oftentimes we come from different lenses and that sometimes the lens that you may be looking, looking at it for your business really may not be solving the problem that your user has. So again, staying focused, number one, on a user-centered approach. So how, what does this process actually look like? It's five steps. You empathize, which is the observe, engage, and immerse. You define it, which is expressing the problem in the foreign form of point of views. You I. I ideate, identify problems to find the solutions. Then you have a prototype, really getting the ideas out into the world, and then you test, iterate, and repeat. So this is something that, again, you're doing over and over again. And it does not mean you're going to go through the whole one, two, three, four, five steps. You may get through one and two, and then you may have to circle back and start all over again, or maybe get to three or even four, and you find that you need to go back to step one in order to get you to where you're trying to go. So in step one, establishing empathy, your goal is to connect to the user's story, emotions, and your insights about them. Who is the user? Those are very, very three very important po points of your user. What's their story? Emotionally, how do they respond? And what other insights do you have about them? Demographics, behavior, all of those uh, nuances that oftentimes we overlook because we're just looking at the hard data. Well, you don't just wanna look at the hard data. You wanna look at the essence of who your user is. So, Let's start in how you start. Again, this would be an opportunity for you to back up and take a couple of minutes. So inspire new thinking by discovering what people really need. So select a population such as busy professionals, after school teachers, and use Google Docs to write down a list of at least 10 challenges they face. For you, I'm asking you to look at your user and be very clear. Take yourself out of it. Try to put yourself in their shoes and say the user that typically comes to my business, that seeks me for help, that uses my product, what are 10 challenges they face? And don't limit them to just using your product or living in your world. A busy professional, an after school teacher, a parent with young children, what are their challenges that they experience all the time that they need help with? I can tell you going through this pandemic 
and being totally uh, immersed in, in uh, becoming a school teacher, a homeschool teacher, you know, my work life uh, balance and, and uh, professional life with my daughter at being 10, going on 11, going to the sixth grade is everything to me because that gave me an opportunity to see just what she was really learning in school and how she was learning and maybe where I needed to step in. So for me, I'm that busy, busy professional, single mother that is trying to run a business, you know, and still needs support to be active and present in their child's life. So once you select the population, again, write down a list of 10 challenges they face. So once you write down those defining, excuse me, write down those issues, now you're going to define the problem. Your goal is to analyze your observations about the user and synthesize them to define the core problems you've identified as a problem statement. This is where you get into the process of really, really helping you get clear on how do you develop a problem statement. So this is part of the formula. You have your challenges, but now you're actually going to take and use this formula and really write down what their issue is. So let's go over this. So we have Sam, he's the user. Who is he? His characteristics, a busy manager who needs a way to integrate healthy eating habits because he doesn't want to feel like he's on a diet. The user need and the insight are directly tied to each other, as you can see. And it puts you in a space where you're able to really, really back yourself up and look at it more from a human-centered approach, and as they call it, a user-centered approach. Because what's happening is oftentimes we solve problems and it's very mechanical, very straight up and down, and you don't consider all of the elements that maybe the user may have, you know, in struggling in using it. So he wants to be healthy. He wants to be on a better, you know, weight loss plan, but he doesn't want to feel like he's on a diet. I'm pretty sure everybody on this call or in this uh, Zoom call right now, nobody ever wants to be on a diet, but you want to be able to eat and enjoy it and, you know, it feel good to you. So this, if there is any time right now to take a screenshot, it will be now. <laughs> Sam is a busy manager who needs a way to integrate healthy eating habits because he doesn't want to feel like he's on a diet. Synthesize a problem state, statement that clearly defines your goal. Define the problem as a problem statement in again, human-centered manner. User name is a user characteristic who needs user who needs user need because of the certain insight. So here is the blank version of that where you can plug in your user's name, their characteristics. What is the true need focused in a human centered way? But what is the insight? What is compelling them? What is the challenge basically propelling them to want to make a change? So now that you've moved past that, now you're going to get into phase three, which is the ideation part. So your goal here is where you engage in unfiltered, unrestrained brainstorming. How can we solve for this obstacle? This is actually the area in design thinking where you need to let your mind be, you know, let your mind wander. Skies is the limit. Come up with as many obstacles as you can for the situation. So one of the recommendations that Google uses is just to create a two by four table in Google Docs and write out an idea. Don't worry about feasibility right now, as they call it, blue sky thinking is encouraged. And this is to allow you to be able to really, really unapologetically just write down and be creative. I believe oftentimes now, once you're in your business and you're growing your business, you know, you oftentimes get caught and you feel like you're probably stuck or maybe it seems like you're having the same idea over and over again. And nothing is new. Nothing has a flair to it. Nothing makes you think outside of the box. As you already know, I'm pretty sure most of you have come up with some out of the box thinking during the pandemic. 
So the suggestion here is to push past obvious solutions and maybe you should write those down off to the side. Say, hey, these are the typical solutions. And then after that, step to the next level and decide, you know, hey, this is what I think could work also, or this sounds crazy, but I'm gonna write it down anyway. And you'll be amazed at how when you unlock that side of you during this process, it allows you to, it allows your brain to start free, uh, flowing a lot freer in a, in a much more creative way. So typically again, we're, we would have taken 10 minutes, one minute per idea, no idea is too crazy and write down every solution that comes to mind. Now that you've ideated and you know decided, okay, let's start talking about your goal. Draw out or craft what is possible from that. Keeping in mind your minimal viable product, your MVP. What is an MVP? Actually, let me back up and explain it a little bit more. Um, so no, we'll, we'll keep going and I'll explain it. So your minimal viable product is not like this. The minimal viable product is all about you being able to create the minimal operating functional product or service that your user could, could take advantage of, right? So let's just use building a car as an example as they have right here. If you tell someone or if, you, if someone told you, I want you to build a car, the process wouldn't go, okay, let me get one wheel, then I have four wheels, and then I'm going to put something on top of those four wheels and voila, I have a car and then I'm going to add a steering wheel. That's not a minimal viable product. When you look at each one of these areas or phases, how, how can they be peeled back as layers and stand on their own? They can't. But this minimal viable product could. We're going to start with the skateboard. So again, you have to be at a certain level of something that is functional and has capabilities and can support your ideas and your goals. Okay, well, now that we have the skateboard, we can, we can cruise along on, you know, around the corner, but you know what? I want to be able to go a mile. So you know what? I'm going to add a handlebar to give me a little bit more balance and leverage. And now I can go a few blocks or I can go a mile away, you know, with my skateboard and a handle. Uh, now, you know what? We're going to add a different mechanism to it. Now we're on to the third stage, the bike, a full bike that now has a wheel, a chain, a pedal, you know, a more sleek design to allow you to go faster for a longer distance. Upon building upon that, now you get to a motorcycle because you have the basic components of uh, the motion of the chain and the wheel and moving at a higher rate of speed, but now you're gonna put a motor to it. And finally, now you end up with the car. For each stage, as you can see, one built on top of the other, it did not occur as it, as it showed here. One wheel, four wheels, a box with wheels, and now we have a car. Oh, don't forget the steering wheel. And oftentimes, this is exactly how we function. Our brains are oftentimes moving faster than what we can actually support, we're, but we're leaving out all types of steps. That is why it's very important in this design thinking environment that you ensure that you're building on top of something for each phase that if you needed to start all over again, you're not necessarily starting from scratch, but you're starting from a viable product that can support the development of your next stage. So now you're building rough prototypes to learn how to make ideas better. Pick one of your feasible ideas, only one, and flesh out how would you build this solution? And in this building, you need to think about the technology needed, the time required, the money, the resources. So basically backing yourself up and having a project plan, having an opportunity to look at, as I said, a feasible means of, okay, I can't do X right now, but you know what? I can do Y. So let me start here and let me apply all the components of building out a project plan, um, a marketing plan, all of those things to say, is this really something that I can develop? And what does that look like? This is the area in your idea that you possibly need to give yourself more time when you're doing it independently, maybe a day, maybe even giving yourself a week of being able to really go through 
do some research. Again, understand time requirements and workload probably are some of the areas that people tend not to account for properly. And of course, money. Um, oftentimes we're really in bootstra bootstrap situations, but you can actually find money if you are very specific in terms of building out your design. Oftentimes we look at money needed for, oh, I need my whole business funded, but you'll be amazed at the grants and the resources that are available for very specific phases or parts of your business that could help you grow. As you can see here, even in this session, if we were in person, it would be 15 minutes, which realistically, once you start going around the room and having these full conversations, it generally turns into more like 30 minutes. But this is really important. So your goal, now that you've gotten to the part where you can test a complete product using the best solutions identified during the prototyping phase, and at this point, you want to refine and alter as needed. This is an iterative process. So in terms of going through design thinking, very simple in its overall scope and its layout. Um, I'm going to back up here just to give you just to give you another point of just going back over of what you're doing in each phase, which phase, which is the process of empathizing, observing, engaging, and immersing of where you want to be and what you want your product or service to do. Now you have to get into the part of defining um, and expressing the problem from the point of view of the user. Don't ever let the user not be the focus of solving their problem. Now you're going to ideate and identify the problems to solve the solution and you go into the prototype. And you guys, as I mentioned before, this is a process that you can do time and time and time again. And this is also a process in which it is great to bring people in at certain times. You have your people who are observe, engage, and immerse, and you need to get their opinion very specifically about those, you know, about that, about that part of the process. When you're defining, this is where you can actually go in and get a little bit more of the technical support and ideal and insight. Again, being very specific to the user groups who are participating along the way. And most importantly, once you get to the prototyping and the testing, now you can start having focus groups and opportunities to keep people focused and clear to help you develop your, uh, develop your product, your service, your thoughts and ideas. So I'll back up. And this, in short, is the design thinking process. And I'm happy to have shared with you. So now we actually have a good amount of time to, now that I've discussed it, we can actually now talk about your business um, and, and really just go into um, what you kind of need to see or hear or, you know, general questions about this process. And I'll keep this up too, hopefully in the background. These are upcoming sessions that I have and I'll reshare at the end um, outside of design, uh, excuse me, Detroit Startup Week. Um, we have some great courses coming up uh, for the rest of this week and additionally next week, which is going to be huge in terms of uh, with Brian Brackeen, who is a design thinking, uh, actually, the guy's awesome. Like he literally um, functions in this way and um, he's actually one of the people responsible for uh, artificial intelligence in the way we know it now. So pretty good, uh, pretty good uh, guy to hear talk. So let me come on out. Let me present myself and let's chat you guys. Well, I definitely, for one, I want to come and say thank you for you because that was, wow. Okay, so I know that, like, I was a lot of, like, I'm glad for touching on those speakers as well because I had a, a session this morning that was talking about design thinking, but not specifically like you and the Google Tech and tools that you can use in order to um, apply that learning. But I just get so inspired now that I get to have these opportunities to listen to you that um, be applied um, for entrepreneurs entrepreneurs like it's to me it's a really exciting just way of applying excuse me a really exciting way of looking at your business and looking at scaling your business 
Okay, so we got a question from Jill Johnson. Can you show the speaker list again? Oh, from the last, uh, I guess from Brian. Okay, sure. Hello, and yeah, go ahead and start dropping them in. Um, hello, my name is Jeffrey, and I recently started to work on my podcast and would like to know what suggestions you have for me to become successful. Jeffrey, don't know if you knew that I had a podcast, but I got some for this, so hold on. <laughs> As a matter of fact, let's see if I can share this. Uh... Oh, okay. Um... Okay, so uh, these are directly from my website where you can go on my social media or you can just type in a link. It takes you to our Grow With Google page. Um, six strategies to make your website work for you. Um, we'll actually be talking about design thinking in this space too. Um, Joshua Edmonds is with the city of Detroit. He is, a, he is the director of digital inclusion for the city of Detroit. As you know, they, um, they look, excuse me, they are donating a significant amount of computers and um, really working with the city of Detroit small businesses to get um, all businesses online. So if you did not know, please, please, you know, stay connected to the city of Detroit's website and sign up for this session because he's going to provide quite a bit of insight and give some free resources out as the city of Detroit, not to mention they have a couple of cohorts coming up where uh, you can participate and receive a lot of free resources that are being donated by small businesses throughout the city. Um, okay, so I'm gonna go back up. I see the questions are starting to roll in. So, okay, feel free. Okay, so, uh-oh. Uh-oh, hold on, hold on. All right, questions coming in. I'm feeling fancy. <laughs> Um, Rebecca, that was when she was telling me I look young. Thanks. Um, great process. Are there other references that we can look up to learn more on how to implement this process? That was from Carrie Berry. So Carrie, I would tell you literally to Google, um, design process, design thinking process. There are videos and there is a significant amount of, of, um, opportunity to do this process. And I've done this class a few times now. And to be honest with you, I'm going to actually do a session where we can do it live and work through the process. It's going to be two hours. Um, and this will allow you to actually come prepared and, and literally do it in a workshop setting where we will all be virtual and we can go through. So please stay tuned to that sign up for my classes in my email and you'll be able to participate, but I'm a huge uh, proponent of Googling everything. <laughs> I'm a heck of a researcher, um, something I just have a natural knack for. Um, so yeah, that's a good way to, to start, but just literally Googling it. Um, okay, so, uh, da, 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 da. okay, Jeffrey, I started, recently started work on my podcast and would like to know what suggestions you have for me to be successful, Jeffrey. I am going to tell you, um, I'm going to tell you one of the best things that you can do in reference to podcasts is actually applying this process. I started a podcast uh, about four, if, no, three and a half, four years ago, and it was related to this program before it got super popular. And I would tell you, being able to be very clear and focused on the podcast, one of the things that happens in podcast world is that you begin excited and you begin talking but it's actually very challenging to keep up a schedule of new topics to talk about um finding new people to collab with in terms of uh speakers it's a full production and you need to identify who you're going to be speaking to you need to say i'm a podcast that's going to serve the technology com community but in reference to what areas and topics so you can become focused. Um, so you're not all over the place. People like to talk to people who tend to actually have a specific niche. Now, if you're talking about culture and current topics, you need to be on that and, and very up to date and reading a significant, a lot, significant amount so you can actually have insight and opinion as it relates to the current event, but tied to other things. 
So I would just tell you in terms of being successful for a podcast, definitely having your podcast plan written out um, is very important and working with the studio that already has the tools. I don't have a podcast studio in my house. I work with Motor City Woman. Um, she is a turnkey podcast solution locally. Um, and I actually get a chance to go into the studio with her and it allows me to have guests. So um, that's my, you know, words of wisdom there. Be clear on who you're talking to. Make sure you have a process um, and a production team to support you and try to write out podcasts and, re um, you know, anywhere from six to eight episodes ahead and record more than one early on. Most people do podcasts and might, may do one, 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 one. No, you need to like record like five or six and load them up all at the same time to get people engaged so they can learn the value of what you have to say. Okay, we have Tracy. When narrowing down your population in order to expand your business's reach, what is the best way to position yourself using Google? Thank you, Tracy, for the Google question. Um, nearing, so number one, it's a couple things you can do. Uh, let's talk about Google My Business, which I'll be, that was my, uh, one of my classes the other, that was going to be yesterday that will get rescheduled. Google My Business. If you are online, Google My Business is so important for you to be a part of. Uh, it's basically now Google has positioned themselves where they can, excuse me, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'll bring it back up along with my information. Um, Google My Business right now allows you basically to, they're acting like a website. So I just saw this comment. Google now is the first, Google now is replacing websites. And I saw that, I saw that headline because Google has the ability now, oh my gosh, the, the course that I, the session that I do on that is, uh, is really, really good. But they have the ability, number one, totally free, track your calls, track, track your directions, hours of operation. You can actually now engage with blog posts. Um, you can create product offers. Uh, you can, you, you know, you're able to, do, of course, do ads on there. And it's giving you analytics without even you going into large uh, Google analytic information. But when it comes to narrowing down your population, um, I would tell you Google Analytics and having that set up properly on your website or even through your social media, looking through digital marketing is the best thing you can do. One thing that all digital platforms will do is that they're consistent in the type of information they provide when it comes to analytics. It may not be exactly the same, but you're going to get basic demographic information. What is the split of population between male and female? Um, you know, what are some of their interests? Uh, what cities are tapping into you? What are some of the other keyword suggestions that they're using? So um, that's a big one. That's a big one. So using your Google My Business, using Google Analytics, and also using Google Trends is a big one, you guys, because you need to see what people are talking about and doing right now. So that's a huge one. Um, hope that helps and answers you specifically. Um, I'm just scrolling back up as I'm looking at other. So I'm glad for this. I'm working. I can listen. Thank you. Please bring the hand. Okay, great process. Are there any references? Oh, okay. We answered that. That was Carrie. We will we have access to this session later. Yes, you will. Hi, Katrina. I wanted to know if if it's a good idea. If it's a good idea launch with only the first product of the MVP process, or should you wait to create two or more products based on? Oh, okay. I wanted to know if it's a good idea. Oh, launch with only the first product of the minimal viable product process, or should you wait to create two or more products based on? Oh, got it. So that that the answer to your question is yes. You can launch with your with you can launch with the skateboard. So we went through the five steps, right? Skateboard the car. If you launch with the skateboard then you just need to build out the plan and what you're going to do, you know, with that minimal viable product. That skateboard, you're probably going to be able to test it. You're going to number one, you still go through the process. Well, the minimal viable product is the skateboard. 
Well, how are people using it? What are some of the challenges? Is it feasible for them to go, uh, you know, a half a block or, you know, 10 miles, whatever the case. So still apply. No, don't wait to create, create two or more products based on a minimal viable product. That was an example of where they were trying to get to the car, but they backed themselves all the way up in order to say, what is the minimal viable product for me to launch to get to the car? So start with where you're at. Maybe your end goal is the skateboard. So if the end goal is the skateboard, what, you know, is that, is that your minimal viable product or is there anything before then that you could support or work for you and your business that could, um, you know, that could work for you? But I would definitely say, start there, don't wait. I would tell you, you're going to find out more about you and your business as you go along. Okay, can you talk more about the prototype phase of design? Uh, a prototype phase of design thinking, how can Google help with this? Um, actually, let me, look, I said, hey Google, and apparently my phone just started talking. They're always listening always listening just know that um <laughs> hold on i'm gonna go back and share my screen again all right hold on y'all let's see agenda yep 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 hold on let's do this a little bit more effectively here we go Okay, so again, the prototype, which is the part where, let me move this so I can read, draw out the prototyping is, as it says, your goal is to draw out or craft what is possible, Keep in, keeping in mind your minimum viable product. So most people get little lost in the minimum viable product. Actually, let me, from a no standpoint, let me just present. You guys are probably going to be able to see this, but I don't, you know, it's not a big deal. Um, da, 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 da. Uh, produce inexpensive scaled down versions of the solutions created in the previous stage. As you build prototypes one by one, they are either accepted, improved, and re examined or rejected based on the user's experiment. This is an experimental stage. How do you know when you're done? when you'll have a better idea of the constraints inherent within the product slash feature, the problems in the solution you're currently prototyping, and then you will have a more informed, informed perspective of how real users would behave. Think and feel when interacting with the end product. So I hope that gives a little bit more, you know, um, a little bit more of a overview. And again, this is, as they said, this is the feel. You always have to keep the user in mind. Uh, let's see. Again, not like this. <laughs> How do you build on top of each phase for the user's experience? And as it said, you know, you accept, you reject, you reiterate. Okay, I'm gonna come out of this so I can go back to, so I can actually go back and see some of the questions. Um, I'm going back up, hold on. Let's see. Oh, I want to work definitely in working up setting Google My Business. Please tune in. Um, just stay connected with me. I'm going to upload in my website on the Google website and also on Detroit Startup Week. Um, are there, hey, Ashley, are there Google products you would re recommend for a solo law firm to attract clients and manage, manage client relationships and interactions? Um, okay, so Google My Business, um, yes for you, Ashley. Client relationships and interactions, no. Google's products and services don't, that's a, that's a CRM. That's a client relationship management tool. Um, I do know because of some marketing I've done in the past, there are very specific tools for um, law firms to attract clients and manage client relationships and interactions. And that is an ongoing engagement process. So Google for that, no, 
other CRMs, I would just, which is CRM is client relationship management tools, but type that in, type in um, law firm client relationship management tools, um, law firm uh, promotion and management, things like that, that will allow you to find and have the tools to support matching up and working with Google. I would tell you though, the Google products that would support you actually would be in relation to Google Trends, Google My Business to make sure that you are you know, front and center, um, Google Analytics, understanding who's coming to your page, Google AdWords, uh, Google Keywords, everyone should be able to use that. Keywords are just, you know, what are the words that are being used in your industry? And different things like that um, and also the trends that are specifically related to your business and um, you know what are the keywords that they're using L listen guys I'm gonna tell you as a those of you who are on the phone that are founders CEOs or whatever you sit in your business a couple of things if you are not savvy in this regard or you do not have the time attending these classes is because you need the information to make the best decision to hire people to know how to do this. I am here to tell you some of this work now has become so sophisticated that, oh, when it comes to example, SEO, everybody's usually like, oh, search engine optimization. Yeah, I pay people to do that. <laughs> I pay people to do that because it has become so sophisticated that my wheelhouse and me as a founder and entrepreneur, I, I can't do everything. And that is a specialty that I recommend people understanding, do you have the capacity and the capability to support that skill set, or is this something you need to outsource? And when it comes to digital marketing, right now, I'm very happy to say we are at the top of the totem pole when it comes to needs for small businesses because marketing online is everything now. The pandemic had me inching along like this, right? Oh, making good trajectory. Well, now my world is wow because everybody had to come to grips with getting around to digital marketing and being online where was no getting around it. It is now or never, and we will never go back to where we were. So understand human interaction online is going to do nothing but continue to skyrocket and, you know, move forward. So uh, everybody needs to get on, you know, get on board and, and go for the ride because the, the train has left. So I just hope you catch the next one on the way around. So can I have a website? Uh, okay. Can I have a website with Google? So I, so I can have a website with Google explain that more. How, okay. So yes, there are, Google does have, uh, Google does provide capabilities of you starting a free website through them. We don't use that often. It does have some limitations. However, it is there and available. Okay, so how can we turn them off from always listening? Hey, Carrie, you can't. <laughs> They're always listening, honey. They're always listening. Um, you just have to go to extremes to turn everything off. You know, take your battery out and plug it. <laughs> Power down. That's about it. <laughs> oh, yes. They put in here HubSpot is a good CRM. HubSpot is an excellent CRM. Um, there's another one called Cartra, C-A-R-T-R-A. Um, Salesforce is actually a CR, CRM that's good. Um, there's some other ones. I can tell you I want information overload these days. So I used to fire off, but those are my anchor, my anchor ones. And listen, the products that are coming out and the services that are coming out from the pandemic that have been refined, because what's happened is the need for all of these tools have skyrocketed. So the user engagement and interaction for a lot of tools, just like Zoom, what we're using now. I just got an update from Zoom today about some new requirements that they have because, you know, they got slammed for their security issues. Well, that didn't become an issue until the whole world started using Zoom. They didn't even know that they had some of those issues or if they did, they didn't discover the impact because they probably had never had the scale of usage that they are experiencing now. So, um, let's see. How can I get Google? How can, oh, good one, Stuart Sandwise. Sandwise, hope I'm saying it right. 
How can I get Google to fix my Google My Business list listing? I have repeatedly submitted corrections that, that don't get correct. All right. So I'm going to put this in here. Oh, thank you, Kendra. Okay, that's a, that's a real issue. You're not the only one. Here is my personal, this is my Google email. I, if you have any personal Google My Business or Google questions that you want to submit to me, please do. Um, there are also Google Office Hours that are happening that I would suggest you guys sign up for those too. But um, one of the things that you've been submitting, so I'm not sure what those corrections were or have been, why they haven't gotten corrected. It depends. It depends. Sometimes it's just as weird as um, you not being, okay, you cannot see my email. I put it in there. Okay. Um, I'll just answer his finish the, uh, answering the question. It is um, how, how can I get Google to fix my business? Um, Google my business, email me. My email is K Turnbull, T U R N is in Nancy, B is in boy, O W. So I'll show you my name and then I'll show you the Google version. <laughs> I'll tell you the Google version. Well, I, I won't worry about that, but. K T U R N. Thank you. Thank you, Vonna. She put in there in there. K Turnbull at Google.com. You need to put in there though, because oh, you will get ignored. <laughs> I ignore certain emails. You know why? Because certain ones just aren't relevant. But if you put in the uh if you put in the the subject line, uh design thinking, and then just question or Detroit Startup Week, I'll know it's relevant to that. And I'm actually going to have a group. Um, you know, emails to monitor and I'll definitely um, add you into my database and all that type of stuff, but you can submit directly to me and I'll try my best to support you. And if I can't do it, I'll definitely recommend, you know, you to someone and see what we can do. Any recommended practices to identify the customer's true issue? Sometimes a customer may convey an issue and it turns that it doesn't represent one of their pain points. Listen, ask questions. I have a few clients, okay? And the thing during COVID that drove me absolutely nuts, nobody asked anybody questions. And being someone who's able to think from a user standpoint and a company standpoint or, you know, producer manufacturer standpoint because of me being in marketing I do that pretty I'm able to do that very seamlessly it's very natural to me and that's not natural to everyone but ask questions you have to ask people your job now is not to think figure things out for people you ask questions you put them on social media you develop forums, you develop small conversations where information will emerge and you have to pay attention Oftentimes, you have to really pay attention to what people are saying. Um, and you have to understand what they really mean. So if, if someone uses a pen and they're like, my pen doesn't write, and you obviously look at it and it's, it has ink coming out, and you realize that they're using a mechanical pencil and they're in their mind because it was mechanical what they're looking for is the smooth rolling uh, feeling of a ballpoint pen or a felt pen or something what you realize is oh it's not that it doesn't work you're not using the product properly or asking people and understanding the pain points of your industry so that's a really big one um we don't ask enough questions we just we just are always in almost like in an automatic response mode. Like, I got to fix it, got to fix it, got to fix it. No, what you need to do is be quiet and listen and ask questions. And people and the internet will tell you everything you have to do. It is not your job or your responsibility anymore to figure out how people feel. You know why? Because there are billions of people online right now all the time telling you exactly how they feel. There is a reason why when you type in keywords in a Google search and it gives you 10 questions or suggestions, you know why? Because there's probably 10 million people asking the same question. Google is the most efficient and reliable place to find out what people are looking for, how they're interacting. I don't care 
If you're talking about social media, that's great. But when it comes to what they call intentional search, Google runs the world when it comes to intentional search. And if you did not know, YouTube, which is owned by Google, is the number two search engine in the world. So if you are the number one and the number two of search engines, I'm going to take a wild guess that they might know a few things. Google Analytics, Google AdWords, Google Trends, and all of those things that provide information in terms of your customers and their user information is imperative. And for those of you who are using Wix and all these other websites and you know Etsy, they all link back to your what? Google Analytics. So if you do not know how to use Google Analytics, I'll also be having a class and a course on that to explain what it is, how it works, and how to properly set up. Because if anything is a pet peeve and something that is dear and near to my heart for small businesses, nonprofits, is understanding your numbers. Well, I definitely, I learned a lot. Uh, <laughs> I definitely am over here taking all of the notes. I hope all of the panelists have been doing as well. Thank you so much, Katrina, for all of your amazing information today.